Since the sexual revolution, attitudes toward homosexuality have changed dramatically. All people want is to be loved, and if people are going to hate on love, that's really ridiculous. Gay and lesbian clubs, pride parades, and gay marriage. For gays and lesbians, the battle seems to be won. Gay is okay. Those who oppose gay and lesbian values can expect labels of bigotry and hate. Widespread approval of sexual freedom extends to everyone, except, perhaps, one segment of the population. Those who seek to leave homosexuality and pursue heterosexuality instead. These men and women have homosexual feelings, but don't accept a gay identity. They believe homosexuality is not who they really are, and instead seek a way out. But those seeking a way out can expect a hostile reaction. Their choice to leave a gay identity is often seen as a betrayal of the LGBT community, leaving them as outsiders. Some of them seek therapy to help them make this change, but their options are limited and sometimes in the face of heavy resistance. Plenty of gay leaders say this kind of therapy is dangerous, homophobic, and that no one can actually change their sexuality. As long as you've got this calcified religious extremist core in this country, you're not going to see this change. If somebody said to me, oh, this is just your religion, I would say, well, so what if it is? How is that your business to determine the validity of my religion? How dare you? Is that not my right? Some even say it should be banned. But others defend it, saying they changed and that everyone should have the freedom to choose their own path and whom they choose to love, even if that means leaving the gay community. A man with same-sex attraction who wants to do anything besides dive full in to his same-sex attraction is really ostracized by the straight community who probably doesn't understand him, the gay community is threatened by him and his personal stance. There's not really a community that does accept him. These men don't want to speak up. This topic is a hotbed issue for politicians. But now they want to tell us that we can't make choices on what we want to read. This is wrong. They're infringing upon our First Amendment rights. So who are these people at the very center of this controversy? Those who seek to leave the gay community. How do they develop these feelings they don't want? Why do they reject a gay identity? And is their change even genuine? This short story follows the lives of four men who found therapy and now say they've discovered a heterosexual nature deep within them. I don't know perfectly the answer, but I know that at a young age I felt overwhelmed at times by my mom and so far off from my dad. In fact, I had this image of like me being in a jungle and like crying as a kid out from my dad and just praying that my father would be like a jungle warrior, like coming and chopping through the bush and trying to find me to hunt for my heart. And as I got older, I think I really started sexualizing that yearning, that longing for being pursued being pursued by a man that saw me, my whole body, mind, soul, being, and, and said, you're enough. You're enough. Probably the biggest catalyst for change for me was when I was on a, I'll call it a splurge, and I hooked up with, I don't remember how many, probably at least 10, maybe 15 guys in a, in a week period. And at the end of that, looking at myself in the mirror and just thinking, who have I become? What have I become? This isn't who I want to be. That's when I said I, enough is enough. I don't have the answers. I don't know exactly where to go, but this can't stand anymore. Back when I was 17, I came across by accident um, this book that was called Loving Someone Gay. And I thought, wow, I need to read this. I need to understand if I'm gay, I hope to get the answers here. Sadly, there was no other uh, view available next to that book or in the same bookshelf. So the whole book is about accepting that because you have some attractions, to the same sex, you are gay. 
I've recognized and learned that in my own life there were two really searing events that kind of created detachment for me. So the first was my um, being born with a cleft and being separated from uh, my caregivers, my mother. I knew on a cognitive level that I was wanted, that I was loved, and yet there was this thing on my face and it made me feel like I wasn't. The second is from the age of 8 to 14 we lived outside of the U.S. and we lived uh, in an African country and when I moved back at the age of 14 it was chaos let me tell you. It was during that time like 15, 16 that when I just felt so inadequate for being who I was, the, the message was I'm not presentable to the world, I'm less than. Through both of those experiences, it was like the trench was dug deeper to be split off from myself. You have the right to change your sexuality and your gender identification throughout a course, the course of a lifetime, and someone may change back and forth. It is not just one identity. I'm gay, but you know, once in a while I'm like, oh, this girl is actually hot. I think that there's no, like, okay, this person is 100% gay, that means they can't think a girl is pretty, and then vice versa. I um, believe that, that even a gay person should be able to um, uh, explore heterosexuality if that's, if that's what they would like to do. I decided to explore reintegrative therapy because I realized I wasn't at peace with myself. There were parts of myself that I didn't like, there were parts of myself that I rejected, um, and I realized that I feared other men, I felt um, less than them, I didn't know how to act around other men. I realized that I had stories in my head that I told myself about women. I wasn't liking who I was becoming. I wasn't liking my uh, behavior. It wasn't in line with my values. I didn't feel like I was being my authentic self. And so I wanted to, to address it head on. When we talk about this subject, identity comes up a lot. Are these people really gay people and we're trying to make them straight? Maybe they were really straight all along and we're just helping them to be who they were. What we're really talking about is the topic of identity. And really, what defines all of us isn't so much who we want to have sex with. It's not our sexual desires. It's our values. And ancient faith traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, uh, ancient philosophers like Socrates, all agreed it's not our desires that define us. It's our values that define us. My clients believe that their values define them, and I agree with them. I sought therapy when I realized that uh, this gay-affirming um, activities and uh, you know, dressing the gay man uh, suit, putting on the gay man hat was really hard and uh, it didn't feel right. Some people like their homosexuality and want to keep it, we want to work on other things. That's great, we work with them. Uh, we have nothing against them, I want to come alongside them just like I want to come alongside any group that feels maligned or uh, attacked by society. So they're welcome here, absolutely. I don't think somebody can go from gay to straight uh, because I think that if you're, uh, I think it's more of a thing that's kind of determined at birth. I think it's just, you know, as, as a, uh, Lady Gaga says, you were born this way. It starts from the very beginning since I started recalling my memories. It wasn't really a choice, it was more of what I grew up into and what became my preference as I was becoming who I am right now. So many people who have same-sex attraction, they say, but I've, I've always felt this way. Of course, of course you've always felt this way. So we know this is coming from a very, very young age. It's a disconnect from the masculinity. So it's oftentimes these boys, they feel um, they feel weaker, they feel um, unable to connect to males, they feel unable to connect to their father. That's probably the biggest one right there. 
the biggest um, factor for me was was not having that not receiving enough affection and attention and care as a, as a kid growing up by my dad and then also not receiving it as much as I needed it from peers as well. As far as for everyone, it's really difficult to determine how every single person develops same-sex attraction. Because uh, people are like, oh no, I have this, I have this cousin, he has the best dad ever, and I've heard all these stories, and there's always these one-offs. But for the vast majority of men who develop same-sex attraction, it does come in a very standardized process. There was a series of seemingly unrelated events that uh, little by little cornered me into this place where I was not affirmed as a boy. I was not affirmed by um, the men in my family. Uh, I was not affirmed by my father. I was not affirmed as a masculine being by my grandfather, by my uncle. I wasn't affirmed as a, a male by my mother, by my grandmother. And this was not intentional of them. What's not being talked about is that many of these men describe remarkably similar experiences in their childhoods. They keep describing experiences with a father who's felt distant to them, critical. The clients will often describe their mothers as intrusive, sometimes overbearing. And these clients oftentimes have a temperamental sensitivity. Now, if you put these factors together, it's going to increase the probability that the boy is going to have difficulty in terms of gender development, in, in disidentifying with the mother and identifying with the father. I wanted to be loved. I wanted affection. I wanted to be cared about. And I wanted it from my father, uh, but then as a substitute, I wanted it from another guy. And when I wasn't getting it from, from a peer, then I ended up turning that into a sexualized nature. The perfect storm for creating same-sex attraction in someone, or male same-sex attraction at least. A father who's there and yet simultaneously not there. So he's uninvolved. He's always somewhere, but he's just unable for the boy to connect with. So he's not that he's out of the home. It's not that there's no father figure. It's that he's, he's there and simultaneously unreachable for whatever reason. And then maybe the, the mother, you know, sees that in the home that the father's not taking up that slack and she is like super mom. She's always involved, hands-on, and so the, the child has tons of female involvement and a very, very limited male involvement. That masculine world always becomes impossible to reach. It's hard because I think my, my mom had hoped that as kids we would be able to reflect to her what she had always hoped her family would be, which is maybe perfect. She struggled a lot with overreacting to us as kids and, and drawing us maybe too close. And my father you know, pulled away a lot and he w was not able to be present with me emotionally. Ultimately, the individual's masculinity hasn't been fully affirmed. And why is it not fully affirmed? They could have a bad relationship to their father or a distant relationship with their father, their brothers could have been bullied in school, could have had sexual abuse, but they question their maleness, right? Their masculinity, they don't fully believe in it. What I see now is that I had attractions that were a result of a lot of my upbringing, and, and those manifested sexually. And once I dealt with reintegrated, if you will, some of those issues, those attractions, first they dissipated and now they're virtually gone. Because of my um, shame about uh, my attractions to other men, I really made a very uh, severe cut between me and other guys. So in that way, uh, I, I did not fulfill this need uh, for masculine connection, to be a man among men. When I was going through puberty, I had a lot of like conf conflicting thoughts about, you know, like, 
you would see like uh, a good looking handsome teacher who's a guy and like my brain would be like he's handsome and I'd be like wait what does this mean for me? It's natural I think I, I it wasn't something if I were to choose this why would someone choose this because people don't they, they're really mean to gay people basically so it's natural. When I first began this process of taking the glasses off and looking at my judgments and my beliefs about men and my beliefs about myself, is that those were two very separate things. It's like, men were this way, but as a man, I'm this way. So, men are strong. Men are good looking. Men are stoic. They don't have emotions, right? Men have it all together. Men are mechanical. Over here, as a man, I am. I felt weak. I didn't feel good looking. I didn't feel like I had what it takes. And so you can see is if I have those false beliefs, taking off the glasses again and recognizing their false beliefs. Are men strong? Yeah, some of them are, but not all. Are all men mechanical? No. Are all men stoic? No. And so as a man, am I strong? Yeah. So learning to accept myself and my masculine attributes and learning to remove the negative feelings I feel toward other men, started, they started to come together. The changes in, in sexual orientation, they're a result of a much deeper uh, process of understanding myself, of um, getting myself unstuck from where my childhood left me. This whole thing of, of trying to say, this happened to me and that person did that to me and that's why I'm like this is, um, it's fruitless for one. Um, and the other is that there's so many nuances to this whole story, in my life anyway, that I couldn't just say one thing caused these, these issues. The more that the individual when they're young is being taken apart by their environment, right? The more shame they experience, the, the more criticism they get, the more protection of, no, 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 you can't play with those other boys in the mud, you might get hurt, you're over here. The more message that they have that, wow, I'm different, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not, you know, strong enough, then they start believing it, right? And then they feel it, and then all of a sudden, once they hit puberty, now the sexual attractions start. I remember being in the hot tub with some friends in probably eighth grade and another friend who was kind of late going through puberty saying, oh, I can't wait to grow hair into my arms. And they were so excited at becoming an adult man. And I was so afraid of that. And I think that is my experience of yearning for masculinity but afraid to see it in myself because afraid the masculine, my own masculinity wasn't enough. My sisters had a doll, a very nice doll with uh, blonde hair, blonde long hair. And one day I took a pair of scissors and gave the doll a haircut, like a boy style. And as I walk into the family room uh, holding this doll, there's a total commotion in the room. My sisters crying, my grandmother shouting at me, my parents afraid because I was holding a doll and a pair of scissors on the other hand. The message here was, you've been a very bad boy and you should not make dolls uh, into boys. Just keep them as they are and don't change things. This is pivotal in, in my development. The reason I did that was um, I had what every little boy has. Uh, I had masculine strivings. This is something that it's, uh, it's part of uh, development. Uh, it's just that I got punished for them. The boy, as he goes into this particular phase of development, is going to have difficulty because the environment is not facilitating the boy's gender strivings, his masculine strivings. And the boy will try to reach out to and emulate other males around him, but if the environment is not conducive to that, in fact, if anything, if the environment uh, makes it more difficult for him, this boy experiences a hurt and he retreats back to the mother and doesn't make that gender identity shift. That's what we see for many of our clients. Girls are their best friends. They know women like the back of their hands. But men are mysterious, men are exciting, men are exotic. Men feel unfamiliar to my clients. Therapy might be a healthy process if the person who is self-identifying as needing that therapy 
Is there with their own consent? Is there with a willingness to achieve something that is dis, uh, prescribed by themselves? You know, if, if a gay man is tired of the lifestyle, whatever that means to them, then um, you know, if they want, if they feel the inclination to, you know, explore relations with somebody that they normally wouldn't. <laughs> um, then that's that's their prerogative. You know, who am I to judge? Who am I to say, oh no, you're gay. You need to only be with men. We have to differentiate between two different types of therapy. There's conversion therapy. You now, conversion therapy is a very broad term. It's a very broad term. It's ill-defined. There's no ethics code. There's no governing body. Conversion therapy is something that's practiced by and large by unlicensed individuals. In reintegrative therapy, the client is in the driver's seat. The licensed psychotherapist says we can use evidence-based treatments to approach your childhood traumas or any sexual addictions you may have. And as that's resolved, the sexuality begins to change on its own. Well, that's one of the misnomers right there, is people think a reintegrative therapy is conversion therapy, where you're trying to make someone, move some, for somebody from gay to straight. Honestly, most of my therapy wasn't at all about the whole sexual attraction thing. I mean, it would come up and we would work on different things, but it was always, what is under there? What is under there? I never at any point felt like my therapist was trying to coerce me or change me to think a certain way. So there's been a lot of this accusation that people have been forced to change, and I think there's some historical truth to that. So if any one of you have let yourself become involved with an adult homosexual or with another boy, and you're doing this on a regular basis, you better stop quick. And if we catch you involved with a homosexual, your parents are going to know about it first. And you will be caught. A lot has come down through pe other people's churches of all the different religions, you know, or people's parents who have had very, very strict views, forcing their kids to change. That is not what this therapy is about whatsoever. It's been about dealing with issues that I grew up with. It, had, it, it dealt with dealing with my dad, and dealing with my mom, and dealing with my peers, and dealing with um, molestation events. I've had clients who have gone to gay affirmative therapists and they've been told that they have to just continue that way of coming out more gay and accepting their homosexuality. We don't force the client to choose that path. We let them choose either option. It's about understanding the shame uh, that the person might feel outside of therapy and uh, getting to the bottom of that shame. Reintegrative therapy for me was Finding the disparate parts of myself that had been lost and bringing them together and becoming whole. The results of being in this therapy have helped me to feel comfortable with who I am as a man, helped me to feel connected to other people, and helped me to feel like a man among other men. It's about reintegrating, which is what we call this, reintegrative therapy. It's the idea of connecting to parts of ourselves that were split off, that were pushed away. Many of my clients felt that their masculine strivings were pushed away and shamed, and, and those masculine strivings were cauterized, in a sense. I really actually like the term reintegration, because it was these disparate parts of myself I wanted to go find and learn about and grieve and heal and pull together and I always felt that from him. Our very first session, that was when I had a lot of shame and angst around my attractions. He said, I'm not going to promise that those will ever go away. And I was like, what? But that's why I'm here. You're supposed to f fix me, you know. He's like, no. He's like, but I can promise that they will no longer disturb you and that you will be living your life fully in however way you choose to and you want to and that those things will no longer disturb you. And by gumbo, he's right. On a neurobiological basis, it's really hard, if not impossible, to get rid of data. But we can reconfigure data. We're not getting rid of something as if we're removing a part of that. that that's the, a big misnomer is that we're trying to get rid of unwanted same-sex attractions. We don't get rid of anything. We help fulfill these men, and as they do so, the sexuality shifts on its own. It's not a, a guarantee. What you, what you can be guaranteed of is, is, is dealing with wounds that you've had and becoming a wholer person.
Yes, I'm gay, and one day maybe I will be with a woman. Just because I'm attracted to a man or woman right now it doesn't mean I'll be attracted just to one or the other in the future. I think exploring your sexual fluidity would be like exploring your favorite ice cream flavors. You can be stuck to vanilla and chocolate your whole life. Yeah, in the future um, I could see myself uh, having a sexual relationship with a person of the opposite sex because I think um, nothing ever stays the same and everything is ever changing. It's not the same necessarily as food or, you know, what movies I want to watch or things like that, but those are constantly changing and they happen necessarily without me being conscious of them. I think one day you might wake up and say like, oh, I'm interested in this. I In a broader context, we should be aware that 30 years of science has shown us that sexuality is fluid and can change for some people. It's not just scientists who are becoming aware of this. In uh, 2016, the CDC uh, released their statements on um, sexual identity. They polled people in the United States and they found that more people, particularly young people, were identifying themselves as being sexually fluid, that their sexuality can change. This corresponds perfectly with neuroscience. We know that the specific regions of the brain that are most responsible for sexual preference are the same areas of the brain that change throughout the course of our life. What psychologists like to use is the Kinsey scale. It goes from strictly homosexual to strictly heterosexual and there's you know all sorts of places in the middle and that people can and do move alongside that and if people can and do move alongside that is it okay for someone to move more towards the heterosexual side and is it okay for someone to move towards more towards the homosexual side perhaps it should be the person's own choice about where they want to move I identify as like gender fluid, non-binary, kind of somewhere in there. Um, and then I'm pan and poly, so I have two like people that I'm dating, and then I have a few other like people that I'm kind of talking to. I mean, I'm definitely identify as gay, but I mean, you know, a nice lady walks by, and I'm like, hey. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I have zero attraction to women. There were certain women I was, I had some levels of attraction to, but um, it was minimal. And I always felt that I wasn't masculine enough to interact with them as a man. It was more like, well, let's kind of have this brother-sister relationship going on, this platonic thing. When I am experiencing same-sex attraction, I feel like everything turns in on myself. It's all about me. It's like a, a star caving in on itself. That's how I feel. It feels palpable in my body. I feel intrinsically disconnected from the world around me. When I step out of that into assertion and into my full masculine self, I don't feel sorry for being me. I remember going to this retreat and all the way to the retreat I'm driving there thinking, I don't know if I want to do this. I got there, I got there late. All the guys are in the cafeteria, right? So I park and I walk up to the cafeteria and I'm outside the door and there's just this roar, collective roar of masculine voices. I felt so fearful that I, I willed myself finally to go in, but I just stood there for a long time. I was like, I don't belong here. I want to get back in my car. I want to drive home. Fast forward quite a few years. I actually chose to go to that same retreat because it's an annual retreat they do for men. I drove up. It was deja vu. I walked up to the cafeteria, I was a little bit late then too, heard this roar of masculine voices. And there was such a difference in my body. I loved hearing that. And I was like, let me in there. Let me in there. That's my tribe, I belong. And that's huge for me, just to say I belong. That was a big piece of work for me. Is 
this recognizing that I'm a man among men and I belong in the world of men and I'm safe here. You know, I mean, I mentioned that I've had an experience that might be categorized as abuse by someone else, but like I said, it left no scar on me and I don't categorize it as abuse. I just was a younger person who had consensual sex with an older person uh, and I don't think it had a major impact. I think it was a healthy, um, mutually agreed upon experience between consenting people, whether, even though I wasn't really able to consent as a young person. I was actually like sexually molested, um, not like anything serious, but as a kid. That, exper that sexual experience with a man early on could have definitely opened the door to me becoming gay in the future. I'm a veterinary student, so I work with animals, and I think you see a lot of animals that are neglected by their owners, and you see the effect it has on their behavior and how they interact with people, and as much as we like it or not, human beings are animals too, and we respond in similar fashions, and if we're neglected, I feel like friends you see, you know, they're trying, seeking that confirmation or love or whatnot. So it does have an effect on their behavior in the future and I feel like they're maybe compared to someone who was raised in a nurturing, loving environment, they're more so seeking it and doing things that maybe someone else wouldn't to try and get that attention or love however they can, for better or worse. The number one type of trauma we see is neglect, and that's so difficult to put a quantifier on neglect. It's by definition, a prolonged non-event is neglect. That is certainly a trauma. Trauma is not just when something happens that day. Trauma can be a, a takeaway of something that's needed, something that's life-giving. My motivation was I want to be as healthy as I possibly can as a human being, period. Whether, I, whether these attractions stay or go, I know I have wounds that need to be dealt with. Part of this whole process was just learning to be okay with myself, shave my mustache off, look at myself in the mirror, say to the world, this is what you get. And I used to not want to make eye contact with myself in the mirror because it, I didn't like really looking at myself. I like what I see. And as we use standard uh, evidence-based treatments, the same treatments that other clinics use, on those specific traumas, these clients notice an increase in their confidence, they feel more connected, more, more um, relaxed around other males, and as a byproduct, they notice the same-sex attractions diminishing on their own. If a client who's feeling this way, that their same-sex attraction really isn't them, goes to a gay affirmative therapist, what they're gonna get is this therapists informing them that their view, they can't hold that view, that they need to just come out as gay, accept their homosexuality, and that's the only thing that's going to make them feel better. There's a large group of men that that simply does not work for, and they don't feel like that is true for themselves. Lawmakers behind a new bill say it's potentially harmful to a patient's mental health. Conservatives say lawmakers are misrepresenting what conversion therapy offers. So conversion therapy and changing someone's sexual orientation or gender identity is not actually a goal that can be achieved. Um, and this prevents people from falling into the false impression that that can actually happen. Everyone should be free to find therapy and support to help them achieve their desired goals and outcomes, not the government's goals and outcomes. The client should be in the driver's seat. Where have we come now to where you can't even disagree with somebody who, who holds the LGBT community and its standards as gold and dismisses my perspective to the point where I should not be allowed to have my perspective? That that is now we've tipped the scale and gone to a completely destructive place. My response to folks that are extremely antagonistic to reintegrative therapy is um, it's actually sadness. They think that their only option now is to affirm what attractions they have, and how sad is that? Now they 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 don't they're not given a choice. They're not there is no option. It's this way you are this way or you aren't. And that's a really sad message when I know for sure that there are alternatives. You're essentially putting people in these perfect little boxes and people don't fit perfectly into boxes. 
That's not reality. And so it would make sense that if you start with a premise that people fit exactly in one box or another, it's going to be hard for you to have an openness to people who have different points of view. If the goal is to completely ban anyone from having access to somebody who professionally could help me work and to find my goals, my life path, you're going to tell me that that's freedom to ban me from that right? In healthy communities, people are free to come and go as they choose. But it's unhealthy when individuals welcome a person into a community, but then try to block them when they try to leave. That's bullying and that's wrong. And my clients have the freedom and the right to walk away from any kind of sexual practice that doesn't work for them. If they want to live in a lifestyle, then that, they can continue to do that. But to take that option away from other people and to, and to push a narrative that, to me, is, is not true, is extremely harmful. At this point in my life where I am uh, doing reintegrative therapy, at, sometimes I feel that, oh, here I am again, fighting against the currents, because now gay is good, uh, gay is encouraged, gay is everywhere. Uh, yeah, if you're gay, you're a superstar. Um, at least that's what the media portrays. There's hope. You're loved. There are reasons you feel this way, and you have support. It's a journey. It's not. Uh, it's not necessarily a destination. It's. It's about about me becoming a more whole person. About me just dealing with myself and uh, being more fulfilled. The results of being in this therapy have helped me to feel comfortable with who I am as a man, helped me to feel connected to other people. <laughs> it's so unfortunate that it took me so, so, so long. Reintegrated therapy. It's it's just exactly what I would have loved to have had in my late teens. It would be the answer to all my questions. But better late than never. <laughs>